This will be our 59th lesson in Ephesians, and we're in the last two verses of the fourth chapter. I wanted to say a word tonight, as I've been thinking a lot about this before I begin. And how grateful I am for the chapter and verse divisions of the Bible. Of course, there's never been an English version that didn't have them. Did you know that? No, the people who talk about them not having those divisions don't bother to tell you that. Wycliffe was the first one that had chapters and verses. Secondly, the Jews, who were totally unlike Americans, were so thoroughly acquainted with Scripture, they didn't need the divisions. They could tell you what the Bible said. Scribes could tell you what, what the Scripture said. We are living in an age when people do not know how to handle scriptures, are not familiar with scriptures, and if they didn't have chapters and verses, nobody would read it. So I'm thankful for it. And to begin with, I'm not sure about who's telling the truth on this issue. I've never really been able to pinpoint who's telling the truth on this. It's all kind of nebulous. But if you could think of yourself, if you preach or teach or anything, preparing something and you had no kind of division in the Bible, no kind of chapter, no kind of, and all we have to do is do a little thinking about it and you'll be very, very thankful that somebody, if this is true, even though the second psalm, I say the second psalm, that's a division, right? So I'm not sure even how true all that stuff is. But I'm very thankful for it. It has been tremendous assistance. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now the necessity of uh, what I call a radical and thorough change of life is taught again and again in Scripture. But in, in spite of that, this is little known. Because of flawed teaching, some people have never connected human conduct with apostolic doctrine. Doctrine. It never. <laughs> when they hear the words, not of works, they think that means you don't do anything. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is kind of ignorant, but that's the truth. They conclude that salvation and works never intersect. Well, what, exactly what kind of salvation would that be? What, what kind of salvation would that be? If the saved person, nothing essentially different, existed about them. You know, just exactly how would you know they weren't saved? How would you know you were saved? If there was not some kind of a change... And we, do, we are quick to assert that at the foundational level, salvation works, human works aren't together. But we are created on two good works, which God's ordained that we should. That doesn't mean ought, you know, if we can. I mean, this, is, this, is why, this is why God recreated you so you do these works. So if you're not doing these works, like exactly how would you establish that you've been a workmanship of God? Uh -huh. yeah. How exactly could that be established? So once anyway, once these things dawn on you, then all of a sudden there's a, a re renewed interest. Now where Paul is elaborating in this text and in the fifth chapter, he'll be elaborating on what the word, that the word is confirmed by human expressions and he'll tell you what those are or are not. He'll, he's going to spell it out, what it is. There's two kinds of works. There's things you don't do and things you do. 
<laughs> it's like a two-sided coin. And he's going to cover both of those. They're summarized by saying, put off the old man, put on the new man. <laughs> That's like a s s summary statement of that. <coughs> Ceasing one manner of life and commencing another manner of life. Now we'll address, there are certain liabilities that people in Christ are especially vulnerable to. And we're going to deal with those tonight. There are things that can more easily find expression in religious people because they're not glaringly wrong. Men will tend to underestimate the, the malignancy of sin. It's, it's malignant. If you give it an outlet, it, it'll grow. Make no mistake, it, there's some plants like that, they just, they just spread all over the place. Creeping, then you try and pull one up, it's got roots all over the place. That's how sin is, see. So men tend to underestimate these, he's going to mention them. There are things the world could be quite tolerant of. They'll let you express them once in a while, just don't go overboard, but they'll make allowances for them. But the Holy Spirit will make no allowances for them at all. Yeah. <laughs> so our text is the last two verses of Ephesians 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God's sake, for God, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Gee, it sounds kind of simplistic, and it's easy to just kind of read over and say, "Yeah, Amen, brother." West, well, Jack, uh, now they're doing of it. That's something else. Uh -huh. I notice we're talking about all. Uh -huh. See, the Lord uses that word a lot. All, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. See. <laughs> All things that pertain to life and godliness, see. He uses that word a lot because he wants your mind to expand, expand a little bit. The word all means every kind as well as numerical. It's every kind. Each and every expression of it, it's a thorough word. It refers to the totality of things mentioned. Whether it's a group of things or one thing, all. All. You can say that because they all have the same nature. That's how you can say all. When you say all, whatever you're talking about is a group of something that has the same nature. See, so all spiritual blessings, they all are related to each other and they have the same characteristic. Sin is the same way. All is sin has certain traits and it's all stimulated by the devil and so forth. I was going to tell us some things that uh, have to go. They've got to go. It says this, let all bitterness, that's interesting. That's an interesting word, bitterness. What is bitterness? You, know, have you, you ever thought about it? I, I, I was a challenge to think a little deeper about bitterness, bitterness. Bitterness, or official definition is, influences or actions that become harmful, harmful to a community. <laughs> Bitterness. It's like if you have a glass of some beverage and you put something bitter in it, it <laughs> pervades the whole thing. And it has the implication of damaging. Bitter things are things that, they're just not like sour things. That's, that's what I'm getting. It's just not like something sour. It's something that has a lasting effect and tends to spread and to contaminate. Bitterness. It has to do with manners, words, and actions that spread defilement. That'd be something like, you want to know what I don't like's going on here? That's bitterness. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think we've been meeting too long. Yeah. That's bitterness. 
I don't see why we have to come together so often. Mm -hmm. That's bitterness. Yes, amen. See, it's introducing something that began to creep and to spread. That, that's the low end of it. There's some high end stuff too. Have you noticed it's so and so? Mm -hmm. Bitterness. Defiling influences. Unsettling. It's a process where corruption and decay commence. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it. You're right. I thought, I've been, and it'll corrupt your thinking. All bitterness. It introduces a line of thinking that is spiritually rotten. All bitterness. And it puts the whole assembly in danger. And incidentally, we are talking about the assembly. When he said, let all bitterness and wrath, he didn't mean from from Given and from June and from my, it, it gets down to that, but it means from the assembly. Mm -hmm. That's the point he's addressing is the assembly. Yes, amen. Amen. Bitterness assumes you're you're affecting somebody else, you're around somebody else. It's just not you. Mm -hmm. And almost all gripes center around self. Yes, amen. Now it's written. Bitterness is a def something that defiles. Now here, here's an express statement of it in Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, speaking of a state of alertness, lest any man fail of the grace of God, he wanders out into life where grace doesn't reach. Mm -hmm. he, he, you, yeah. you have to be close to Christ for grace to reach you. Amen. There is an answer. There is a circumference of life outside of which grace is a non-functional. Uh -huh. yeah. You see, receive the grace of God in vain. How are we wandering out yeah. right. of the area where grace works? Does uh -huh. any man fail the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up yeah. trouble you, plural you, and many be defiled? Yeah. Thereby, and thereby, by that root of bitterness, many, oh, I've seen this happen. In the past, I've seen it happen, and I've seen it happen in our history here. So this creeps right, creeps right through. First thing you know, something that was said, something that was done, it begins to, many is defiled by it. Maybe some people overcome it. But you shouldn't have to be overcoming stuff in the assembly. Yeah, amen. <laughs> you should be able. You should be able to kind of lower your shield a little bit and start on the receiving end yeah, instead yeah. of receiving fiery darts. You, you can receive some edification. Yeah. See, this is why he's saying this: that all bitterness be put away. Yeah. Bitter, a root of bitterness was when Ananias and Sapphira lied about the what they gave. Had that not been dealt with, there would have been some other folk that would have come forward and done the same thing. Not because they knew Ananias and Sapphira did it, but because that opened a door through which Satan would come. It was a defiling act, even though it was a secret one. But Satan picks it up. He'd have picked it up. First thing you know, there had been a lot of people doing this. Would have been as many be defiled. Remember, all of these things all are basically self-centered. Only the things that bring a supposed advantage to the individual. That's the only reason Ananias, Ananias as far would lie. It gave them a better advantage, presented them in a better way than they really ought to have been presented. Now, Peter affirmed to Simon the sorcerer, you remember, down there in Samaria, who wanted to buy the ability to confer the Holy Spirit. Oh, today they don't say that, but they go to school to be able to. That's right. <laughs> they, they have a particular doctrine that will enable them to confer the Holy Spirit. See, they, but it's the same thing. And he, he attempted to purchase the gift to confer the Holy Spirit. With money, he attempted to make a purchase of that ability. And here's what Peter said. You're in the gall of bitterness. 
Now this couldn't be done, but let's just say it could be done. There'd have been a line the next day <laughs> by Peter. People wanting to buy. Yeah, that's right. yeah. It was a gall of bitterness. That means this this thought you had, Simon, this is an infectious thought. It's crept all through you. Now it's dominated you. Instead of you giving God glory for what you've seen, you, you are so self-centered, you're thinking about you want to be able to do this too? You're in the gall of bitterness. And James said, you know, Paul told husbands not to be bitter against their wives. I'm the boss. You, know, you got to do what I say. Don't be bitter against your wife. She may say, well, I'm not going to do it. I'll tell you what, I got grace too. But first thing you know, you got, yeah, but there's people who teach like this now. There's people that teach like this. And we've mentioned this before. The Bible doesn't say the man's the head of the house. It says he's the head of the wife. It says the wife's the head of the house. If you don't know where, that's your business. Find out where it says that, but it does say it. Amen. Put away all bitterness. James talked about bitter envying. James 3.14. This is the idea of something that sets decay in motion. Now this requires spiritual sensitivity and alertness. Sometimes just a, a boisterous laugh can like set the thing off. And bitterness creep through. Let all but anything that doesn't help, anything that has an after effect that's not good, put it away. All bitterness. And wrath. Other versions refer, call it rage, heat of passion, hot tempers, fury, fierceness. It's like a boiling over of. So the festers inside that it boils over, that it explodes in an outward action, wrath. Not a godly outward action like Jesus cleansing the temple, that wasn't wrath. And it also has the idea of it, it boils over and it subsides. Then a little bit later it boils over again. Then it, now of course if you've been around church circles for a while, you've seen some of this happen. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't keep a log of all the times I saw this outbreak of anger among Christian people. Red face, blustering, put it away. The wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. The sudden breaking forth of anger is not like the wrath of God. It comes from the flesh, see. And Anger, wrath, that's the explosive, Ang that's the inside view. Anger, wrath is the out, outside manifestation. Anger, violent passion or indignation. Some people are like a time bomb ready to go off. They just get upset about anything. Yeah. Maybe while the praise is going on, they go, they go like that, you know. They, always upset about something. Put it away. I understand there's time to be angry, but sin not. We're talking about the sin not when anger erupts in sin. This anger is like other expressions can only take place when the old man is let free. Yeah. Put it away. You don't want the air assembly to be a place where anger's busting off forth all the time. <laughs> and clamor. <clears throat> clamor, that's brawling, wrangling, noise, loud quarreling, shouting, roaring, yelling, loud threats. That's some of the different. <laughs> so when does that ever break out? Well, if you've, you've been in Christ, been around religious together, you've seen this happen. Sure. This happened when the when an insurrection arose against Paul. 
Some cried one thing, some cried another. The assembly was confused. The better, the more part knew not wherefore they had come together. They were just, just, just <laughs> clamor. Just a boisterous, boisterous assembly. Someone leaned over and said, what, what are we shouting about? I don't know what we're shouting about. We're just, as clamor, just a lot of unnecessary noise, clamor. Same thing happened when Paul was given a defense and the Sadducees and Pharisees were there and the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection and the Pharisees didn't believe in the resurrection. So Paul brought this up concerning the resurrection and brought it into question. And a great cry yeah. arose over this. That was clamor. That's what that was. Now there's some people that can inc incite clamor. Sa Satan has workers that can like make this clamor erupt. And we're very blessed that we've not had any displays of this here. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. That means we've got to be on guard. It doesn't happen because I've been in places where this, I've ministered in places where this arose and it was hard to get over it. It's hard to get over clamor. It has like a corrupting influence upon the people. And you really have to labor. To, some people just quit. They just drop out because of it. No clamor. And put this all away. See, this doesn't mean that it's going on. Mm -hmm. It means the capacity is in you for it to go on. Yeah, that's right. And when you put off the old man, you, that's how you stop this stuff from happening. But everybody's got the capacity. Well, incidentally, this applies to the children, too, all these things. Children aren't to be fussing among themselves and arguing and my dad's better than your dad, this sort of stuff. See, this applies to them, too. Clamor. It's a, it's a non-productive, inhibitive activity. And evil speaking. Some words read slander. Abusive and blasphemous language. You know what you are. You're just evil speaking. It's thinking to tear down the other person with your words. Evil speaking. You weren't respected of me. That was a trouble. Evil speaking. This kind of speak is related to slander. So what are you supposed to do with these things? These capacities these latent expressions that are in the old man and just waiting for an opportunity to erupt, put away from you. Let all these things, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamors, be, be put away. I mean, you got to get them out of reach, so to speak. Brother Gene. Before we get too far from your comments about these things, could you make some comments about the distinction between standing up for the truth and a righteous anger and and expressing the kind of the kind of expressions that John had against yeah. the scribes and Pharisees and that the Master had against the scribes and Pharisees and yeah. Paul's had against them by contrast to this because some think that even oh, standing up for the truth uh -huh. is, is an expression like this. Right. Yeah. Standing up for the truth is not self-centered. It's God-centered. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the difference between these two. These are an attempt to justify self. Yeah. The others were an effort to justify God, to see yeah. he was justified in all those things. That's, that's the difference. Yeah. And you have to be sensitive yeah. to recognize that. Some people, they think they are defending God, but they're, they're in the flesh, see? And the flesh makes, think about you. If I don't say this, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I gotta get this off my chest. Go ahead. But some people think that any kind of, <laughs> no, any I kind know. of expression against some, another yeah. mm -hmm. is, is evil speaking. Yeah. And is out of line. It's never, ever. Yeah. Well, when someone has violated the truth, somebody's got to oh, stand yeah. up and say something. Well, I know you, I've heard people say this and heard you that Jesus never said anything bad about anyone. Mm -hmm. Have you heard people say that? Yeah. Huh? Have you? They just haven't read the Bible. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Some of the more lengthy discourse, one of his more lengthy yeah. discourses was saying bad stuff about the Pharisees and Sadducees. Right. So yes, this Brother Gene is right. This is, we're talking about 
expressions of the flesh that center in self and really do not have God or his will or his purpose in mind. That's not the thing, not the thing that's driving it. Put it away from you. Some versions say, get rid of it. Or, must be removed. Must be put away. Must be far removed. Should have no place in our lives. Take it away. Banish from among you. See, this is collected up. Keep in mind. This is speaking of an assembly. Of course, it can't be true of the assembly if it's not true of the individuals. I understand that. But the focus is on the assembly. Now, you will notice that in our assemblies, and this has been a very purposeful action, as much as we can, and in a state of growth, we try and make provision for edification to take place. Yes. But it is possible to make provision for these things to take yeah. place. Say, for instance, if you deal only with controversy all the time, you just deal with controversy all the time, and you never make affirmations of the truth, you just deal with argumentative things all the time, you're making a place. So when you put this away, put it away from you, it involves a couple of things. One is, the people themselves must meet for the purpose of edification and praising and exalting God. And secondly, they've got to have an environment in which these things are out of place. Now some expressions like this that we've experienced in the past, yeah, I would find it hard to believe they could happen now. That happened before. And they never were like of a super serious nature, but it was, they was grievous, just the same. But it would be, they would be less apt to happen here because we put in our thinking, we don't think with these and things in mind. Put them away. Again, all of these transgressions, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, they all postulate more than the person is involved. This is not like a one-person thing. Bitterness is somebody else's. There's some other people aren't being considered, or bitterness doesn't mean anything. And wrath and anger and clamor and speaking, they all presume there's more personalities involved than the, than the person. So they are to be put away from the individual members, but the point of this text is the assembly is to be spiritually structured so like there's a wall mm -hmm. that prevents these things from coming in. And that structure is edification. It's everybody having the same mind and the same judgment and focused on Christ and this sort of thing. It was apparent from this text that there was some provision in early assemblies for expression. Mm -hmm. See, this is telling you that the assemblies were, yeah. there was some provision for expression. We don't know how many, but there was, they had some kind of provision for people to express themselves. Yeah. Flesh would say, this is my chance. Yeah. So Paul says, put this, put this away. With all malice, malice, generally speaking, is unkind acts or spitefulness or wickedness or maliciousness or hatred. The idea is to hurt somebody. Spitefulness, ill will, baseness of any kind. In English, the word includes the idea of spitefulness or holding a grudge. That'd be a kind of a modern way of saying it. Paying back, well, they had that coming. All malice, I'll get you back, I'll have my day, my day's coming. All malice, if someone hurts you, you are to bless them, not hurt them. That's what Jesus said, bless them that curse you. <laughs> That's what he said. See, how do I do that? That's what you've got to work out. Yes, you first have to be determined that you have to do it. Yeah. Then once you do, work it out. You know, the, a lot of efforts made to keep everybody happy and to yeah. accommodate everyone's preferences. Actually, 
helps people to maintain their bitterness. <laughs> Very the, good. Uh, different types of, you have a traditional service and a contemporary service, and then, uh, meetings for the young, meetings for the old, for the single, for the married, and it goes on and on. Actually, uh, is trying to work around yes, and help Very people good. keep these things. Very good. That's different than putting it away. Yeah. See, if someone, let's just take a practical uh, modern scenario, someone says, I come from a rock and roll background and I like hard rock Christian music. And I'm not coming unless you have it. Well, he should defer. Yes. The other person who loves the, what we might call the more traditional music, with him, it's not he just doesn't like it, the other kind. That's not what it is. It's that it's abrasive to his spirit. That's not what these others, that's not why the traditional, it like it bores them. It's a different, it's a different kind of reaction. Yeah. Yes. This is all included in the let not any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. This is all a, a means of communicating with one another, but this, it's a corrupt means of communication. When you allow these kinds of expressions to erupt, it's not working the righteousness of God. Amen. Pulling down and destroying. See, this is where culturing your spirit and walking by the spirit, living by faith, prepares you to be in a productive environment. If you feed your mind on flesh and this sort of thing, this prepares you to be a vehicle for the other things to erupt. And, and here we have another one of those ands. <laughs> and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. See, it's not enough just to put away the things, it's the and. Yes, amen. You put them away so what follows the and can take place. As in putting off the old man, we put off the old man so we can put on the new man, see. We're denying God's and worldly lust so we can live righteously and godly in his present evil world. See, so the one is in order to the other. Both our actions are, are necessary. Now, it's again apparent that when this is in the context of an assembly, one another. See, it's in the context of an assembly. It's not common for men to consider the assemblies of believers. This is a very uncommon view. In fact, it's, it is relatively new to me. Because I've been, I was brought up in this other mindset. But here you've got it, Paul wrote to the assemblies, Jesus talked to the assemblies, the churches, the single them out. So the church view, or the congregational view, or the assembly view, is all through Scripture. Yes. But Babylon has been so pervasive that sometimes it takes us years before we see what is really apparent. Once you see it, but it's been hidden. Yes. God, can, God, Christ in particular, looks at congregations. Yes, amen. I've actually seen this for People who go to the workplace trying to live this way and fight with their brethren on the Lord's day. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's right. Oh, yes. They, I've never, seen they, never, they don't see this applies to the brethren first. Mm -hmm. you know. Amen. I, I've seen I, it. I was that way too. I've seen it. I know what you're talking about. Be ye, plural. See, that's plural. So this is the assembly. Other verses read, instead instead of giving an outlet to these other expressions, instead, be. See, that's an important word, too. <laughs> Not do, be. Mm -hmm. See. Yeah. Other versions read, instead, be, or become, or have, or on the contrary, learn, or you must practice. See, some of them try to... But I like this idea of be. That's something you are. It's not something you do, it's something you are. Yeah, uh -huh. See, you do what you do because you are what you are. That's right. <laughs> Amen. The word be has the following meaning. To become, to come into existence, 
to begin to be, to receive being, to become. That means you weren't this, but you became this. Be. I love the word. It indicates a condition takes place if the hindrances are put away. This is something like the word let. Let presumes you've got the hindrance out of the way and then it moves out. This is a B that presumes the other's been put away. In other words, spiritual growth will take place if the hindrances are put out of the way. Amen. It will take place. Why? Because all lack of interest, sluggardliness, so forth, all of that exists because the old man hasn't been put off. That's why that yeah. condition exists. But as soon as you put off the new man, then suddenly this interest and this zeal and this quest for truth rises. This is just what happens where there's newness of life. Yeah. Newness of life breaks forth. Sometimes tradition like lays a, a driveway over the seed bed. That's what it does. It lays a concrete driveway over the seed bed so nothing can come up. You get that driveway out of there and the seeds, they, they begin to come up. <clears throat> these, are, these effects are actually wrought by the Holy Spirit. It's His fruit. Be, the thing that, the thing that makes you be is the work of the Holy Spirit, see. Through the Spirit. He's the one that changes us. And we're talking about a change instead of giving expression to these other things. B, this is the Holy Spirit that works the change that makes that happen. But he doesn't do it while the flesh is raging out of control. Yes, amen. So it's the responsibility of saints to crucify the flesh and put to death the deeds of the body. But that's just that's just the scripture. When they do, this other begins to break forth. Now this is the most difficult to explain academically. I don't care how long you've been in Christ. When you get to talking about this, it's hard to be satisfied with, with what you said. It's very difficult to explain academically. Owing to weakness and ignorance and a lot of other things associated with novicehood, the crucifixion of the flesh has to be an ongoing activity. He is not a once for all. And denying in God's is an ongoing activity. Because of this condition that we've got an old man in the house, we've got a nature in us that wars against, got a law in us that wars against the law of our mind. Because of that condition, you have to constantly be putting away and being something else. Well, what are we to be? <clears throat> be ye kind one to another. It's on an individual level, but it's in an assembly in the context of an assembly. <laughs> be ye kind. So, so what does kind mean? Courteous, yes, generous. Gentle, use, uh, here's what it, the word actually means, useful and helpful. That's what the word itself means. Benevolent and kind, sympathetic or helpful. It presumes that you're in the process of adding to the brethren instead of taking from the brethren. Be kind. I like the thought of it. There's sympathy involved. There's consideration involved. There's love involved. But kindness results in some kind of an asset being given to the person. It just is more than politeness, although politeness, it does involve politeness. But it's, it's more than just being polite. It's being helpful. The idea is that of being useful or profitable to others and not being abrasive. Uh -huh. Being loving and forbearing. See some, I mean, like, have you thought about this? It's possible that when you're in the assembly, you're kind of in a world of your own. Thinking about yourself, you know. And 
to worry about doing something that doesn't pertain to the assembly. And it's possible to be in that category. Yeah. Kindness has to do with profiting. Amen. Let's take it a little further. Tender-hearted. Well, be tender-hearted. Be. Mm -hmm. Not get tender-hearted. Be yeah. tender-hearted or compassionate to one another. Mm -hmm. Another version says full of pity or merciful or sympathetic or compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted. The word tender-hearted means having strong bowels. I and mean, that's a literal meaning. These are spiritual bowels. See, your spirit has inward parts, like your like your soul does, like your body does, has inward parts. And tender heart is down deep in the in a per person's in, in in your person. It's something very deep, like your bowels. It's unseen, but they're they're always active. If your bowels ever cease to be active, you are in some real trouble. There are people whose spiritual bowels aren't working. They are clogged up. This is the truth now. Tenderhearted has to do with that part. Peter said, Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. That's a breakdown of tenderhearted. Jesus is tender-hearted. He's able to be touched yes. with the feeling of our infirmities. See this. If there's going to be a part of you that's sensitive, don't let it be your pride. Mm -hmm. Let it be your heart. Yes. Amen. Be tender-hearted. Yeah. You've experienced this, I know. Someone has expressed himself, and your heart just, mm -hmm. heart just goes out. Yeah. Out to them. You want to help them. Not only admirable, tender-hearted is not only being admirable, it's a necessity. This is not the place for hard-heartedness. They take it a little further. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Some verses that read freely forgiving one another. Forgiving one another readily and freely, the Amplified says. Now, it's understood that a person who sins against another is to repent. We understand that. Jesus said, if he repent, yeah. forgive him. Yeah. We understand that. But this text is not intended to be a thorough coverage of the details involved. This assumes that what is necessary for forgiveness has taken place. Be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. I know you know this, but there are some people that have lived with remembrances of being offended for years and never quite got over it. Like my brethren. They think the brethren didn't treat him right, brethren did something didn't like, so they've been, they've been nursing this thing for years. Like this has got to stop tonight. It's got to come to an abrupt end. Because you, why? Because that calls for hard heartedness. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. The, the slightest crack in the door that allows for forgiveness, you ought to rush. <laughs> you ought to rush through it, so that nothing's uh, nothing's between you and your brethren. Yeah, brother, if you, if you consider how much Christ has forgiven you, you know, greatly assist. Oh you yeah, in amen, your amen. So you you see just by these words, uh, here's this is something Jesus said on this subject. This is Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? That makes this a very serious matter. <laughs> so if you don't forgive, God, God will not forgive you. That's, that's just the way it is. If you do, God will. There's another view of reaping what you sow. The last said is, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. <laughs> Notice the godly discretion with which Paul addresses this subject. He doesn't just let it stop, you ought to be forgiven. He doesn't let it stop there. He gives you a reason. Yeah. Yes, amen. 
He doesn't deliver this teaching from Sinai. He delivers it from Mount Zion. Yes. Sound reasoning buttresses any call to duty, see? Yeah. Even as... Other versions say just as, or so as, or as readily as, or according as also. Paul does not give you a procedure on how to forgive. He's going to show you someone who did this. The new man has been created in the likeness of God, as Colossians 3.10 says, so it will be able to do what God does in this matter. God for Christ's sake. Now other versions read that God in Christ forgave you. In Christ God forgave you. Through Christ he forgave you. By the Messiah he forgave you. Because you belong to Christ he forgave you or because of Christ. Now all of these uh, versions reflect an aspect of the word. It is true. Because this uh, word sake, this is a very big word. It has a lot of different facets. I'll give you the academic definition. It speaks of a place in the presence with or then the power of, under the influence of. That is, forgive under the, while you're under the influence of God. Sometimes it refers to time, of a period of time in the course of or within denoting a point in time when something occurs. At, at the point this occurs, you were like God. Another is from the causal view. It is the, the means of you forgiving was God. That was the means of it. And there are various other uses of it also. Now the idea for Christ's sake is it's a doctrinal statement. It summarizes the wide range of the meanings of this word. If you were to remove Christ from the scenario, God would not have forgiven you. That's what this means. So whatever you may think of God, the love of God, <laughs> the mercy of God, the grace of God, if you take Christ out of the picture, you would never have been forgiven. Amen. Amen. Yep. God for Christ's sake. Yep. Christ is not honoring you by forgiving you. He's honoring Christ yep. Yep. by forgiving you. Amen. See, that's, that's the difference. That's right. For Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. What follows because of Christ, what follows is because of Christ, that follows is forgiving. Be God has forgiven you because, because of Christ. That's why. Amen. He was looking at Christ when he forgave you. He wasn't looking at you. He's looking at Christ when he forgave you. Now this, uh, admittedly, this is a, a technical, technical thing. I understand that. Notice he says he has, he hath or he has forgiven you. Now the word forgiven, like what does that mean, forgiven? It's an act of kindness, the favor, in which pardon is issued. Or to put it another way, the, the account is, the debt is taken away. So that you don't owe God anything because of that debt. Paid it off for you. As forgiven, but it was forgiven for Christ's sake. Amen. That's why it was forgiven. It wasn't given because you repented, forgiven because you repented, although you did have to repent. But that isn't why God forgave you. He didn't forgive you because you repented. He didn't forgive you because you were baptized. Even though you had to do those things, He forgave you for Christ's sake. Right. Amen. Because to not forgive someone like that would dishonor Christ. Yes, that's right. Christ died for sinners. Yes. So when sinners see this, and they repent and they come to God, God says, I'll forgive you for Christ's sake. Right, yeah. Just so you'll know this isn't just something between me and you. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. Just so you'll know that. Yeah. I'm doing this for my son's sake. Yes. I'm honoring the son in doing this. Amen. Now I'm blessing you in the process. Oh, that's a great truth. Yeah. 
You might say that Christ legitimatized mm -hmm. God forgiven you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, amen. Then he tells you, of course, the gospel's telling you what Christ did. And see, it focuses on it just so you, this isn't like a nebulous thought to you. He was freely, forgiveness was freely given to you in Christ. Notice how this forgiveness is stated in Scripture. Jesus is always brought into the picture. When he's talking about forgiveness, he always brings Jesus into the picture. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He has spotlight on Christ. He loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. See? From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. See, he's talking about forgiveness, but see, he's pointing to Christ. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached to you forgiveness of sins, see, for Jesus' sake. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. See, every time he talks about forgiveness and remission, he ends up talking about Christ. Amen. It's not the experience of forgiveness. It's Christ that's the focus. That's right. God looks at Christ when he forgives you, and when you're forgiven, if you look to Christ, your conscience will be purged. Amen. All right, now God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now let me ask you, don't you think you could do the same thing? Yes. Couldn't you forgive your brethren for Christ's sake? Couldn't, couldn't you forgive your brethren because you wanted Jesus to be honored? By you having a, the kind of tenderness he had towards you. See what this, what he's saying yeah. here? Amen. It's marvelous. Yeah, it's very compelling. Forgiving one another even as. Amen. God for Christ, he got forgiven you. So if you, after the devil's told you all the reasons why you shouldn't forgive, yeah. then think about this. Yeah. Why did God forgive me? For Christ's sake. Then... I can see I can now legitimately forgive this person, but I'm going to do it for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Not for my sake. Given you can greatly assist each other, the members of the body, and when, when, it's, when it is needful, to, to, instead of saying, well, you should forgive them, tell, give them this That's answer. right. Amen. Yeah. It's wonderful, I'll yeah. tell you. It's, it's a, like a liberating yes. <coughs> type right. thing. Amen. Now, there's a remarkable consistency in apostolic doctrine here. Christ is set before us as the one in whom duty is perfectly displayed, even as Christ. I give you the text here. Even as Christ was raised from the dead, so also we see even as Christ. And all the admonitions to husbands and wives. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Why be subject to your husband? Even as church is subject to Christ. See, the, even as. There, it's all over in Scripture that Jesus is your, your ultimate example. Sister Barb? I was considering that whenever things are viewed from the fleshly relation level as brother to brother, forgiving this brother for the brother's sake, that's when there's more of the temptation for the rest of the things we consider tonight yeah. to be hung on to. Mm -hmm. The bitterness and wrath yeah. and anger. But whenever you consider Christ, those things are loose. Amen. You don't have a place to, to hold to any longer, and so yes. that, that's when you're free from them. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, we've, uh, we've experienced some of this here. There's been brethren that have publicly asked forgiveness for things that maybe you didn't even know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't look at it, but they have asked forgiveness. Some of publicly pointed out how they were more harsh than they ought to have been and so forth. See, that this was expression, so this right here. I say this to point out that this kind of thing is happening among us. Yes, amen. I think it can, it's like any other mm -hmm. virtue. It can grow, but just the fact that you've seen some, you've seen this thing happen, mm -hmm. didn't it touch you when you yes, did? Amen. Yes, and you were touched with the sensitivity of the person, and, and it, was, it was the opposite of bitterness. Bitterness is spreads an infection. Mm -hmm. But this spreads like the balm of Gilead. Amen. Right. Be tender-hearted, yes. forgiving one another. And 
and I want to emphasize again, this has to do with it has to, two of the children too, because sometimes children, some of my people make a point, children don't hold malice, but sometimes they do. Being kind, being forgiven, this is for everybody, not just for the mature. Why? Because when these, ver these vices are put away from us, as he said, when these virtues are put on, like he said, it creates an environment, an environmental, an environment in the assembly where the Holy Spirit can move about freely and angels can minister freely and Jesus can teach freely. See, it, it, it clears the way for a lot of things to happen Amen. that wouldn't happen otherwise. Amen. And as I say, we have experienced some of this and we want to experience more of it. Yes, this is why people will confess, I get so much when I come to the assembly. This is why. Yes. Now, now we're explaining why. Yes. It just isn't that we're all nice people and it, this sort of thing. We want to be kind and nice and polite and courteous, mm -hmm. but we want it to be for the right reasons. Yes. Amen. Amen. I think I'll close there. Any of you have a word you'd like to add? Yes, Brother Jeremy. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm sure... Uh, many of us here have been to different services where uh, this was going on, this bitterness, and just no progress was, was made. That's it was, right. It was just, uh, you could feel almost feel the tension in the air, and it, when you're done, well, you've said this before, it's like you have to uh, recoup after you leave the services. Where yeah. This is, should be a time where, of growth. <laughs> That we come out of the world yeah. and be able to, to have a time where we all come together with the sole purpose of building one another up. Well, now today we have services that are tailored to bring in the enemy as if this is what the services are supposed to be for. And those who are believers, they're, they're the ones that are starved and, and pushed away. But I can see this is the work of the enemy to do that. Because this is a time for us, the brethren, to come together and to strengthen one another and to build one another up and, to, and for each one of us to be helpers of one mm -hmm. another's faith. Mm -hmm. So this, this is just, a, to me, this is like a starting point where we should yeah. come together here and, and, and get rid of all the, the bitterness and all that stuff. That should just be a starting point so that we can increase together. Amen. In the world, this is compelling for Christ's sake. That's a compelling thought. Whoa. Now, the world, it may forget and forgive because it's expedient or it's profitable mm -hmm. to do that yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But in brother, now, yeah. uh, yeah. dishon dishonors Christ. Amen. And, you know, when you forgive mm -hmm. for Christ's sake, act, you could probably say, can you really forgive out any other way? No, not, I mean, he's, no, not acceptable. For Christ's sake, right. he sanctifies mm -hmm. uh and uh, you're forgiving. Your, your ability to even forgive is done He, he him. did die to take away sin, right? Amen. So this blends, yeah. for this higher forgiveness blends with that purpose. Oh, Brother Aaron. This, uh, God forgave us for, for Christ's sake has uh, a lot of good effects to, for us to know that God found the reason to mm. forgive in Jesus. Oh, hey, man. Just think Good about the, what's commonly um, presented as God's motive is that uh, because He loves you so much. Mm -hmm. And just think about how differently that text would read if He said, uh, "Even God forgave you, even because He loves you." But that that uh, mm -hmm. re it reduces the impact of sin. It reduces the uh, the holiness of God. Mm -hmm. The righteousness of God, but when it's presented just like it is, mm -hmm. God found reason to bless you in Jesus. Mm -hmm. now, see, that that heightens your sensitivity to mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. It heightens your your love and um, honor of Christ and mm -hmm. His work, and it also uh, heightens your awareness and sensitivity to the righteousness of God. And God can't. God's not dealing with us directly. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with us through an intercessor. That's right. Through the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Yeah. Brother Jonathan. Going over these various <laughs> things we are to put away, like bitterness, clamor, wrath, environments that have, where those things are dominant, 
they not only like are unproductive and cease growth ceases there, but it actually causes decline and withering. That's right. You'll yeah. actually like when you're subjected to that a lot, which in my experience, well, unfortunately, I have been. But you'll go from things like rather than thinking what's the what's the thing I can do to advance my brother, you're thinking more like well, what's the most damage I can do to that person, <laughs> yeah. or you'll go from. Right. I, I can't wait to meet with the brother to where I don't want to be, I don't want to meet at all, or I want God to be justified. I want myself to be just. It, it, you see a whole shift in the way you think when you're around that all the time, and so I, the passage that instantly came to mind is like, don't give place to the devil. That's right. Like, in order to get around that, you you have to open the door for that to happen. So part of it's not like just not letting yourself do it, but just stay away from environments where that stuff happens. Amen. Yes, yeah, you, you can reason like this. You can reason, I should be holy. Or you can say, I'm going to be holy for Jesus' sake. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Hmm? I'm, I'm going to put off the old man for Jesus' sake. Yeah. I'm going to put on the new man. It changes, it changes how you think. You're honoring Christ because this, by doing this, you're saying, I believe, Jesus, that you took sin away. Yeah. I believe that you reconciled me to God. I believe the door that you opened up a way, new and a living way, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on what I know for your sake. Amen. Boy, that's that's good stuff. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Uh, most of the thinking back on it, most of the times I've heard this these scriptures used were <clears throat> to defend someone's rights. You know, they say, "Well, you, you, you ought, see, you ought to be kind." Yeah. You know, and, and it's been in a retaliatory sense, yes. yeah. rather than in what we just heard tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Good. Good. It's good to be able to say, "You know, I noticed you were kind." I want you to know how that ministered to me. Yeah, I think I think I will pick up on that myself. Yes, I noticed you were tender-hearted. I just wanted you to know what that. Yes, amen. What that meant to me. And it does, doesn't it, when you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Brother Paul. That, uh, God forgives and blesses you because otherwise it would be to dishonor Christ. Similarly, on our, on our end, is um, when we bring these things into the assembly, these, this malice, this bitterness, these things, we are dishonoring Christ because the assembly is the bride of Christ. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. 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 All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the nature of salvation and for the preeminence of Christ and how he's relevant to everything that we do. We feel as though you're beginning to show this to us in a larger way, and we, we give you thanks for it and pray that you'll evermore give us this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.